Topic 5b, nonlinear regression. In the last lecture, we talked about linear regression where we are fitting straight lines to a set of measured data points. Well, what if this isn't a straight line? What if it's a sine function or a square root or something that we can't cast our set of equations into matrix form? How then do we do a curve fit? And that is what nonlinear regression is. I want to set up the problem and then cover some background material, which is specifically multi-parameter Taylor series. You likely have seen the Taylor series, but what about the Taylor series for multiple parameters? Armed with that, we're ready to formulate nonlinear regression, and it looks kind of strange and intimidating at first, but then when we step through the algorithm, I think you'll see that it's actually quite easy to implement. Now, this is a finicky algorithm, and when you watch the MATLAB session, you'll see that it can fail a lot, particularly if you don't feed it a, a good initial guess. So we'll talk about the algorithm and then we'll run through an example and you can code your own example at home and, and match the data that we're getting in this example. So onward. So let's set up our problem. Let's say we have a function f of x, but it's maybe something strange and it has a bunch of curve fit parameters is a naught a1 a n that somehow define f of x and we get y from that and we could do a number of things for example our a coefficients could be a b and c in this function over here our a coefficients would be also a b and c and in a third function again these a coefficients that we're trying to find would be a b and c the difference between this and what we did last lecture is that these are not linear functions and we have to do something very special to cast them into matrix form so that we can come up with an iterative algorithm to do the curve fit. The way that we will convert our set of nonlinear equations to a set of linear equations is using the Taylor series. However, since we have multiple parameters, we need to learn how to do the Taylor series with multiple parameters. Man, there's a lot of detail we could go into here, but we're going to drop all the higher order terms and not go so far into the, the depth of Taylor series. So uh, up front here, we have a one parameter, a single parameter Taylor series. This is probably something that you've seen in your background. And it's a way of approximating F with a series of terms. And we choose another term that I put the little tilde over top. And that's the term that we are writing our Taylor series about. We're estimating at a value of F, but we're using information at a value of X tilde. And so then we have the, the, the first order term, second order term, third order term, and so on. And there's an infinite number of terms. We can generalize this to two parameters. It has the same basic form where we have our function, we have our first order terms, we'll have our second order terms, and that would go on and on and on. And it gets uh, quite crazy. But it turns out for us, we are going to drop all of the higher order terms and only retain those first order terms. At this point, we can generalize to an n parameter Taylor series. So we want some way to estimate a function of multiple variables. So that equals a function written about specific numbers that we'll be able to put numbers to, plus these terms that we'll be doing our approximation. And you'll notice these difference terms I have lumped into delta x. And delta x is simply the difference between one of our unknowns and the value that we're doing our Taylor series about. We're going to use this to convert our nonlinear functions into linear functions. So on to the formulation. And just to warn you again, the, the equations here seem rather complicated and intimidating, but when I step you through the implementation, I think you'll see that this simplifies down to something quite palatable. We start our formulation by writing our function at every single one of our measured sample points. So if we have m samples, we will write our equation m different times. We're also going to include these residual terms to remind us that these 
these equations without this are not exact. There's, there's error here. The other thing we'll do uh, that's a little bit of shorthand, rather than keep writing explicitly these curve fit parameters in our function, we just won't write them. And we'll write this in a much more compact notation here. But all that is is our set of equations with our function written at each one of our sample points. Now, that set of equations are nonlinear. Maybe it contains a square root or an exponential or something like that. So in order to convert it over to something that is a linear algebraic equation, we will convert each one of those to a Taylor series. And so it's the same m equations. We're just approximating our function with the multi-parameter Taylor series. So here we are, and we still have the residual terms. On to the next step. That large set of linear equations can now be cast into matrix form. This first column vector are containing our measured values of y. This is a column vector of our evaluated functions at our measured values of x. We then have this big, ugly matrix where all of the derivatives from the Taylor series have collected, and we will call this our Z matrix. We then have a column vector of the delta A's. And when we formulate our iterative algorithm, we will be solving for that column vector, and that will tell us how much to change our curve fit parameters from one iteration to the next. And then, of course, the last column vector are our residuals. At this point, we won't keep writing that big ugly matrix, although sometimes we'll expand on Z. And we end up here. That is the equation from the last slide. Now, since we're developing an iterative algorithm, we can drop these residual terms because we will iteratively improve on our solution. So we drop that for now. The next step is we'll bring this column vector of our function evaluations, we'll bring that over to the left-hand side. And notice now these are our measured values minus our evaluated values. This is really telling us the error in our measurements. And so we'll call that D, and that's really an error term. At this point, we have more equations than we have unknowns, and we can solve this using least squares, which means we pre-multiply both sides by the transpose of Z. And then we, we're solving for this delta A column vector telling us how much we will change our curve fit parameters from one iteration to the next. And here's our solution in the sense of least squares. On this slide, I just want to note again that we've solved for the delta A column vector. So from iteration to iteration, we're not solving for our new set of curve fit parameters those we store in the column vector a when we solve that matrix equation by least squares it's delta a it's how much we have to change a in order to calculate our new curve fit parameters and so we iteratively do this on to the algorithm and i think more of what we discussed in the formulation will make sense as we discuss this in the framework of being an algorithm Step zero in our algorithm, we have to populate that big ugly Z matrix that contains all those derivatives. So analytically on paper, before we even get to the computer, we need to derive partial derivatives of F with respect to each one of our curve fit parameters. So in this case, that's going to be A naught, A1, all the way up to AN. However many of those we have, we have to evaluate that many analytical derivatives. Once we have that, we need to make an initial guess of our curve fit parameters. Now, this iterative algorithm is very touchy to our initial guess, and the more we can do to make an intelligent guess, the better. When we get to the example of a Gaussian, I can show you one way to make an intelligent guess, and hopefully you know something about the function you're fitting to to help you make that intelligent guess. Otherwise, you'll just have to try a bunch of different things and keep rerunning your code until it does converge.
when we get to the MATLAB sessions, you will see how finicky this algorithm can be. Once we have those curve fit parameters, our initial guess, we want to evaluate the function at each one of our values of x using our current curve fit parameter. So at first, this won't be such a great curve fit. And by the way, I'm using a notation on this slide that you may or may not have seen. I'm writing these column vectors as row vectors, but then I write a little transpose operation. This is not implying that we actually want to take the transpose. This is just a shorthand notation that lets us write a column vector horizontally across the screen. Once we have evaluated our function at each one of our point x using our curve fit parameters, we can now calculate that error term d, and that will be the difference between our measured values and our evaluated values. So in MATLAB, this is just one line of code. Step four, and this is the step that seems rather complicated and crazy, but I think you'll find that this isn't so crazy once we get to our example and implementation. But this is all the derivatives that came out of the Taylor series, and we need to populate this with numbers in our algorithm. Once we do that, we have our Z matrix. Now we're ready to solve our matrix equation by least squares and calculate that column vector delta A. That tells us how much we need to change our curve fit parameters in order to get the values for the next iteration. So once we have delta A, then we simply just adjust our curve fit parameters by adding the deltas to it. And by calculating it this way, that also gives us something that we can check if our algorithm has converged. When the delta A's dip below a certain threshold, we can say that our algorithm is finished. So we check that. And we look at the relative change in delta A, and we can look at the largest change, we can add them all up and look at the overall change. We can do a number of things, but essentially when that falls below some tolerance that we've defined for all of the, the curve fit parameters, we can say that our algorithm has converged. Here's a block diagram of the method. And above the, the blue dashed line, this is what we do on paper before we actually get to the algorithm. And the first thing is evaluating the partial derivatives of our function with respect to each of our curve fit parameters. Then the first thing in our algorithm is to make an intelligent guess for our curve fit parameters. And the more you know about the physics of what you're fitting to or the function that you're fitting to, the better job you can do. All right, next step, evaluate the function at each one of our values of x, given the curve fit parameters we just made an initial guess for. Once we've evaluated that, we can look at the difference between our measured values and our evaluated values, and that difference is our error term. Then we build our z matrix. Now given d and z, we can calculate delta a by following least squares. Once we have delta A, we can update the column vector A, which are actually the curve fit parameters. And then we can check, has this delta A, has that fallen below some threshold? If it has, then we're finished. If not, we repeat this iterative cycle. And slowly our curve fit parameters should improve if the algorithm is converging. And this can go crazy and not converge. Some final notes on nonlinear regression as we presented it. We really can fit any curve to any set of data. The only requirement is that the first derivative has to exist. And why is that? Because we have to populate that big Z matrix, which contains all of those derivatives that came out of the Taylor series. I also mentioned before, this method is rather finicky and it doesn't always converge and it may take several attempts in order to get an answer out of this. And a lot of this goes back to the initial guess. The better or more intelligent we can do, job we can do at getting that initial guess, the better this algorithm will work.
Another thing that we could do is instead of using a nonlinear function like a sine or cosine, we could put in the equation of a straight line and we would actually see that this nonlinear regression algorithm reduces to linear regression. Linear regression is a special case of nonlinear regression. Well, there's nothing better than an example to see how all of this comes together. And in this example, I'm also providing actual numbers. So if you implement this in MATLAB, you can compare back to this to see if you're getting the right answers. So what we'll do is we'll fit a bunch of, of measurements to a Gaussian. Along the bottom, those are the actual points, X and F, and I've plotted them. And it's a smattering of points. And we want to fit this to the Gaussian function that I'm showing in the upper left. And if we look at our data, eh, we can kind of see that there's a Gaussian happening here. But obviously, this data is quite noisy. So that's the setup of our problem. The first thing we'll need to do is identify all of the unknown parameters. What, what parameters are we using for the curve fit? And then later on, we'll be taking partial derivatives with respect to each one of those. But right now, we just want to identify what those are. In a case of this Gaussian, it is simply a, x naught, and sigma. So our column vector A will contain the capital A, the X naught, and the sigma. Those are the curve fit parameters in this case. Now we need, we're not even in the code yet, we need to derive expressions for the derivatives to populate our Z matrix. So if we look at the first column, we can see that we're always taking the partial derivative with respect to capital A. It's just that we evaluate it at different points, x1, x2, all the way up to xm. So we just need to take the partial derivative of f with respect to A. And when we do that, we get our original Gaussian back divided by A. So it's just our original function divided by A. And we could have written it as the ex exponential function with all this stuff divided by A, but it turns out this will be a more convenient form to write this in because we will have already evaluated F and we can simply just divide it by A. We look at the second column. Here we're taking the partial derivative with respect to the X naught curve fit parameter. So we work through that math and again, where we find our original Gaussian back, we just replace it with f of x, and this will become a convenient form to write that partial derivative. The last column is the partial derivative of f with respect to the last curve fit parameter, sigma. And you'll also see we're, we're putting f back in where the, we had the original exponential for our Gaussian. And that's the most convenient form for this. So we've derived the partial derivatives so that we can populate our Z matrix. So putting those answers into the Z matrix, we have this. And this looks rather intimidating and difficult. And it turns out the MATLAB code to do this will be quite simple. And we're going to write this in a slightly different form. We have this bolded X. This bolded X will be a column vector of our measured values of x. So if we apply our function to that column vector, we'll get another column vector, which is our evaluated function. This is something we have calculated in a previous step. So to get the entire first column of our z matrix, we'll just take this column vector and divide by a. Likewise, over here, we'll take that column vector, we'll calculate this, and do a point by point multiplication and get a new column in our Z matrix. And very similar thing here, just slightly different math in this term on the side. And that will let us do this in MATLAB very simply, as you'll see in a minute. Okay, so we know everything about how to populate the Z matrix, we're ready for that. And now we need to think about how we make an intelligent initial guess. Well, we know ahead of time that we're fitting to a Gaussian. And so we can look at our samples 
and maybe look at the maximum value from that and say, you know what, that's probably a good first guess for that amplitude term A. And in fact, that's how I did it in my MATLAB code. We need to know our first guess for X naught. Well, we have our measured values of X over some range. Maybe we just guess that it's at the center of that by taking the average. Maybe we look at this previous step where we found the maximum value and figure out where that happened. And wherever that happened, we could make that our value for X naught. That's a possibility as well. Then last, we need to give a guess for sigma, the width. Now we could maybe do some analysis on our samples and make a guess at that. Instead, what I did is I looked at the entire span of X values and said that sigma will be half of that. And that seemed like a good place to start. So here's my MATLAB code for doing that. My first guess for A is just the maximum value of my measured values of F. The, the offset or the center position of the Gaussian, I just took the average value of my measured X values. And for the width, the, the sigma parameter, the standard deviation of the Gaussian, if you will, I looked at the total span in X and just set it to half of that. Now we enter the main loop. Step A, or the first thing we do in our main loop, is evaluate the function at all of our values of x using our current curve fit parameters, so A, x naught, and sigma. So we can do this with just one line of code in MATLAB because A, x naught, and x, s, sorry, is just single numbers. xm is a column vector of all of our different values of x. So f comes out being a column vector of our function evaluated at each, each value in that column vector xm. So running over 10 iterations, here's what the function value looks like for each of those iterations. So our first iteration is the first column, second iteration is the second column, third, fourth, and, and so on. So one line of code to evaluate the function at each value of x. Now that we know that value of x, that's stored in column vector f, and an input to our algorithm are the measured values of, of f, if you will, we're calling those y, and the difference between those is our error. And so we look at that, and we calculate our error function. It's the difference between our measured values and our current fit. And at the bottom, I'm showing values in that column vector d for every iteration in the loop, up to 10 iterations. Third step in the main loop is building this Z matrix, which seems daunting, but that MATLAB code I'm showing in the upper right, that's it. That's what builds the Z matrix. So remember the first column in our Z matrix was our function evaluated at all the values of X, which we did a couple steps ago. We just divide those by A. So over in MATLAB, Z1 becomes a column vector and it's just our evaluated values divided by A. Little z2 is our second column in Z. And look at the relation between our expression and over here. So one line of code to evaluate that column vector. Z3, very similar thing. We calculate the third column in X. And this is why when we found the exponential in our derivative, we replaced it just with f because we don't have to be calculating an exponential now. We just fill in that column vector of the evaluated values of f into those equations and we don't have to recalculate that. It's a lot faster. Again, put yourself in the mentality of every time you evaluate that function, maybe it takes a long time. So once we calculate those three column vectors, we stick it into z and get our big matrix z. So here's what Z looks like on the first iteration. Not enough room to show all the iterations, but here's what Z looks like at the 10th iteration. Well, now the big ugly step is done building the Z matrix. We have D, our error column vector, and our square matrix Z. Sorry, that's not square. It's actually a rectangular matrix.
And we need to solve this in the sense of least squares to get the delta A column vector. That tells us how much to change our curve fit parameters. So solving by least squares, just one simple line of MATLAB code, and it gives us a column vector of how much to change the curve fit parameters by to get to the next iteration. And here's what delta A looks like for 10 iterations. And we notice that those changes are getting smaller and smaller, and that's suggesting that our algorithm is converging. Once we know delta A, we can update our value of A simply by adding the delta A to A. Now for me, rather than storing our curve fit parameters in a column vector, I like to store them separately because they're used separately. So that means I update them separately and I need to refer to the specific elements in this column vector DA separately. And so now I'm showing if I were to put these in a column vector, what the curve fit parameters are over 10 iterations. And what we can see is that the values are starting to converge to and, and looking the same as we go iteration to iteration. So that's also telling us that our algorithm is converging. Very last thing, we look at that DA and we take that column vector DA, we'll divide by the values. So we're doing a point by point division to get the relative changes of each of our curve fit parameters. We want to ignore signs, so we take the absolute value. And I chose to look at the maximum one and make that the error. And so when that error dips below a certain threshold, we can say that we're done. And in the bottom, I'm showing that ERR over 10 iterations. We can see that number getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And that indicates that our algorithm is converging. At this point, our algorithm is done, and we can say those are the curve fit parameters. So we can throw those into our equation of a Gaussian and end up here. And that lets us plot a nice smooth line that goes through our data points. And we can see that that is the Gaussian that those data points are representing as best as we can extrapolate in the presence of noise in those samples. And that's it, that is nonlinear regression. Here's a visualization of nonlinear regression happening over uh, the first 10 iterations. And you can see it getting better and better and better. And it may jump around a little bit at first, but it will start to converge to the correct answer.